Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us for our third webinar, a part of our Patient Ambassador Program. My name is Lauren Foreman. I'm the Executive Director of the Chris Klug Foundation, and I'll be introducing you to today's moderator and panelists. I'd first like to thank our partners on this webinar, the COVID-19 Transplant Communities Coalition. It's made up of American Transplant Foundation, Donate Life Weld, the John Brockington Foundation, Keep Swimming Foundation, New Jersey Sharing Network, and Transplant Life Foundation. If you're new to GoToWebinar, you'll notice that you have a box to field questions to the panelists on your console. We're going to have a brief Q&A at the end of the presentation, so we encourage you to type your questions into that chat as they come to mind. You'll also notice a button to raise your hand. Please only use this if you want to ask your question over the microphone rather than typing it into the message. If we see a hand raised, that'll be our signal to unmute your microphone when we get to your question. We'll be also doing a comprehensive follow-up, so sending your questions in will help us answer any that we don't have time to get to. And now I'd like to introduce your panelists. Dr. Matthew Cooper. Dr. Cooper is a professor of surgery at Georgetown School of Medicine and the director of kidney and pancreas transplantation at the MedStar Georgetown Transplant Institute. He's the current counselor for the American Society of Transplant Surgeons, he is a current board member for the National Kidney Registry, the American Foundation for Donation and Transplantation, the International Pancreas and Inslet Cell Transplant Association, Donate Life America, and the local OPO Washington Regional Transplant Community. Dr. Cooper has served as chair of American Transplant Congress, and Dr. Cooper was recently chosen as president-elect of UNOS. Thanks, Dr. Cooper. Dr. Miklos Molnar. Dr. Molnar is a Hungarian-American transplant nephrologist and an associate professor of medicine at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Memphis, Tennessee. Dr. Molnar serves as director of the AST Transplant Nephrology Program at James D. Eason Transplant Institute, Institute me, in Methodist University Hospital. And recently, Dr. Molnar authored Outcomes for Transplant Recipients in COVID-19 Research Study. Don Eric Black. Don Eric con connection to donation began in 2006 when he donated his kidney to his father. Fast forward a few years later and through a successful transplant and recovery for his father, Don Eric's health, specifically his heart, began to fail. And in 2015, he was listed and received a heart he desperately needed at the Cleveland Clinic. In addition to being active with Donate Life Ohio and speaking at various events throughout the state, John Eric is also active with the Heart, American Heart Association and has recognized as a heart hero in 2013. John Eric was the Chris Kluge Foundation's 2017 Bounce Back Give Back Award winner for his dedication to organ donation awareness. And last but not least, your moderator for this webinar, liver transplant recipient, Olympian, and founder of the Chris Kluge Foundation, Chris Kluge. Thank you very much, Lauren. Thanks for the great intro. Thanks to Dr. Molnar and Dr. Cooper and Don Eric for uh, joining us today. Hope everyone's doing well and staying healthy and having a great fall season. Uh, we're gonna have a great conversation about uh, COVID-19 and how that relates to uh, all of us in the transplant community. Uh, I certainly have a lot of questions and uh, hopefully uh, Don Eric and uh, Dr. Cooper and Dr. Molnar um, can all help us answer some of those questions. Uh, in any case, what I'd like to do is start out by sharing my story just for a couple of minutes, and then I'll pass it to Dr. Cooper for his presentation, uh, then on to uh, Don Eric to share his story as a donor and a recipient, which is uh, a very unique perspective, and then Dr. Molnar is going to uh, share his presentation. Then we'll come back. I've got a few questions, uh, a little Q&A session, and then open it up to uh, all of our attendees. Uh, that are joining us today uh, to have a chance to answer some questions that I may have missed. So hopefully that sounds like a good schedule. Uh, as many of you may know, uh, I'm a 20-year liver transplant recipient. I received a life-saving liver transplant July 28th uh, in 2000, celebrated my 20-year uh, liver anniversary this summer, and uh, just had a 48th birthday yesterday, so I'm stoked to still be here and, uh, of course, very grateful for my second chance. and. Uh, of course, like many recipients, I know Don Eric, uh, I've heard his story as our Bounce Back Give Back Award winner with 
Chris Klug Foundation at our Summit for Life a few years ago. I know he feels the same way and, and many recipients are, are truly humbled and, and grateful by uh, for the decision that uh, our donors uh, have made and, and gave us a second chance at life and, and many others. So uh, I know that uh, I speak for many in saying they're the, the real heroes of this whole process. Um, let me share my story just for a minute. I've been a uh, avid board sports uh, enthusiast and athlete my whole life. Uh, pretty much anything that I could stand sideways on and slide down the mountain or, uh, or roll on concrete on my skateboard uh, interested me. Uh, I was an avid skateboarder as a kid. I saw the first snowboards and, and naturally said, that's skateboarding on snow, I gotta try it. Was of course immediately hooked and, and all I wanted to do. And uh, I think that passion and, and that enjoyment for the sport led me to try my hand at a few competitions. And uh, I met with some early success, but most importantly, really wanted to do more. And that led me to the 1998 Olympics. Uh, I represented our country in snowboarding's first ever Olympics in Nagano, Japan in 1998. I was off to a great start and in, in the silver medal position. Unfortunately, my second run didn't go quite as planned and I ended up uh, in sixth place in the 98 Olympics, which was uh, really frustrating for me. I recognize that was one opportunity I, I may never get again. And I just came up short uh, on that day in, in Nagano, Japan. Uh, very few people knew that in 98, I was also on a weight, on transplant waiting list, diagnosed through a routine physical with primary sclerosing cholangitis, and uh, knowing that at some point in my future, I would need a liver transplant. Uh, that came in the spring of 2000. I was upgraded on the list to a more critical stage and told that uh, all of the bile ducts were beginning to become scarred up and was time to get more serious about a transplant. I've been on a waiting list for almost six years, and uh, about three months at a more critical stage when I got that call July 28th to get my butt down to Denver and, and get ready for a transplant. And I really had trained in effect for this race for my life. And uh, I have to say, right when the lights were about to go out for me and uh, the anesthesia was taking effect, I remember looking up at my family saying, am I gonna make it through this? That's uh, how scared I was, but I'd really done everything I could to put myself in a great position to bounce back strong uh, from that transplant. And, I had confidence in the transplant team and the, and the medical professionals that were around me and um, had faith in my preparation. And uh, so I did wake up seven hours later, my arms in the air yelling, I rule, which sounds bizarre, but clearly <laughs> the big numbers were talking. And uh, I mm -hmm. felt like a brand new engine got dropped in me and knew I was gonna make it back. I woke up and said, oh, that's what it's supposed to feel like. I felt whole for the first time again. And as I said, knew I was gonna make it back. I did make it back and 18 months later was representing our country again in my second Winter Olympic Games uh, where I won a bronze medal and got to share that with all of my friends and family and with my donor family. Uh, I got to put that around the neck of my donor family and uh, tell them thank you and that I'm here today because of their heroic decision. And uh, that was a really special moment for me and for my family. And I think a great, uh, a great celebration and, and victory for the transplant community to show everyone what's possible after a transplant. I'm way healthier and way stronger than I ever was before my transplant. Uh, celebrating my 48th birthday yesterday, I got to go get my checkup this morning and uh, looks like I'm gonna stick around for a few more years. So I'm happy about that. I don't wanna go anywhere. It's been uh, an amazing ride and very much want it to continue. But I do love uh, to show the world what's possible after a transplant. Um, I am way healthier, way stronger than I was ever before my transplant. There are more responsibilities that come with that, and we're gonna talk about some of that today, um, but it's a small price to pay for a new lease on life and, and getting to be here with all of you. Thanks so much to uh, all of our attendees that are joining us today. And again, to uh, uh, Dr. Cooper and Dr. Molnar and, and Don Eric, we've got an incredible conversation planned, and uh, I'm gonna do my best to help, uh, help MC it and uh, help us uh, facilitate a great conversation. So on that note, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass it over to Dr. Cooper. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Cooper, for joining us today. Um, I know that uh, uh, you're gonna have a great informative presentation. Uh, I'm gonna pass the mic over, uh, over to you now uh, to share some insights on COVID-19 and the transplant community. Chris, can you hear me okay? I can. 
Great. So, so I really appreciate this opportunity. That is a horribly difficult act to follow. So I, I love to hear <laughs> stories uh, of success. Uh, people that I've had the pleasure of working with this in the field know that I, I think I have the best job in the world. It's when I get to see results like that that continue to reinforce that I, in fact, do have the best job in the world. Yeah, when, well, I really want to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity when when asked to speak to patients, I mean, to me, that's a that's an easy thing. I, I love the opportunity to be able to speak about transplant and what we do. As mentioned, I'm a I'm a kidney and pancreas transplant surgeon from Washington D.C. It's been a, a incredibly interesting time in Washington D.C. Uh, I'm also privileged to be the uh, president-elect for UNOS, and so I have some um, I think an interesting perspective on on COVID and how it's affected transplant. And I I, I don't mean this to be a lecture. I'm hoping this is uh, more informative than anything else, but I, I want to tell a story. And at the end of that story, I hope you're all going to think that this is a real success story when we think about the success of transplant through this incredibly difficult time. And, and starting off here, not to uh, insult anybody, but I think it's interesting. I could put this slide up with this picture anywhere in the world. And at this time, regardless of language, uh, creed, color, Everybody, I think, knows what this picture stands for, and it's been, like I said, an incredibly challenging year. Um, who would have thought a, a virus that's responsible for the common cold could end up uh, becoming such a huge problem? But it being a novel strain of the coronavirus, being novel in medicine is not usually a good thing. And in this instance, it means that we, we really have no innate immunity to this virus. And um, again, when we get to the bottom of my talk, we'll talk about um, the development of vaccines. Um, but again, this has been you know, a really Im incredible year um, uh, for obviously many reasons. This is um, what may seem to be a, a complicated slide. We have the benefit now of being able to look in the rearview mirror uh, of exactly the um, pathophysiology of this virus. And um, it really is a, um, an effect of two things, you know, that the virus, you know, actually um, causing its injury per se, and then really the, the hyper uh, inflammatory response or the immune systems are overreacting to that virus, which quite frankly is you know, what caused the majority of the problems in patients and it leads to the clinical signs and symptoms that you see on the bottom of the slide. But I, I, I'm going to eventually come full circle and say, when we talk about transplantation, it's interesting in that the many success stories in treating this virus were appreciated that um, affecting that immune response that we do in transplant all the time was really you know, what was incredibly eye-opening and why now the second phase of COVID that is unfortunately going through our country, we're perhaps better prepared and able to more confidently move, move forward with transplantation. So now we are, uh, again, talking about typical symptoms of COVID. And I, I, I interesting, I, I like this slide because in earlier this year, the, the conversation was, well, in order to be diagnosed with COVID, you had to have a fever and you had to have a cough. And you look at that fatigue. I think most of us feel that way about three o'clock every day. But I think what we quickly learned thereafter is that COVID was nothing typical whatsoever. And in fact, you know, the, the, the reality is that there was many people who had unfortunately developed COVID that were asymptomatic. Um, but it is, again, interesting to see how when we started, we had a very sort of limited view about what this virus is and how it presented to itself. Our, our friends in the Northeast you know, were really the, 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 the place in the United States that really got hit hard from the beginning where we learned a lot of our lessons. And I, I, I want you to just see the, the overwhelming um, influx of patients in just a short period of time in New York, over 5,700 patients admitted for this deadly disease. Um, and if you look at the uh, box on the right and you look at the percentages, the acute beds that were actually taken up by COVID virus uh, in this, just the city of New York was just uh, tremendous. But we learned you know, that um, it, it initially was thought to be a, an illness of the older, I don't say old anymore, the older, median age of 63, a greater predominance of males. And, and the comorbidities, high blood pressure, diabetes, and obesity, um, again, not uncommon in many of our patients who uh, ultimately need organ transplants. But there was unfortunately then a perception that uh, in order to develop COVID, um, that patients needed to have one of those comorbidities. And I, and I choose hypertension in this instance, this was data that came out of Italy that demonstrated that those that had high blood pressure, there was a greater risk of, of morbidity and mortality than those that did not. And again, correlating that with being older and even in younger patients, an additional comorbidity of hypertension had a worse prognosis. And so, 
uh, we began to begin to build this story that um, comorbidities and, and patients who were sort of more susceptible were those that had um, illnesses you know, that preceded their, um, their exposure to COVID. And the picture began to get a little more clear yet complex when we look at um, the data as it was gathered. Who would have ever thought you'd know so much about PCR testing? But that's exactly you know, the, the way we began to develop the identification of this virus, even in an asymptomatic population. When you look at you know, the, um, the solid bars on this slide, you recognize that the detection of the virus can be you know, as early as um, the initiation of symptoms. But for some people, it was a little bit uh, frame shifted to a week or two later. And eventually in the dotted lines, we're still trying to figure out what seroconversion means in terms of developing antibodies. But it was a little unlike uh, other viruses and other bacteria that we had experienced in our past. But um, as a community, we've begun to come together to figure out how to do testing better. Um, uh, we know that there's sort of multiple ways in which people can be tested. Um, the, the spike protein, uh, who would have ever thought you would understand and, and know so much about a spike protein on a coronavirus, but now it's become sort of part of our everyday uh, language. Um, and that, in fact, is very critical when you talk about the development of, of vaccines. Most um, patients are diagnosed with nasopharyngeal swabs. Many people have had more than one of these tests, and I can see everybody shuddering the, who's had to deal with these nasopharyngeal swabs. But as mentioned, you know, that, that virus can be uh, present uh, as early as the first week of symptoms, day one of those symptoms. It usually declines after a couple of weeks, but particularly sicker folks, it can, it can last for a long period of time. We're still trying to understand uh, the antibodies and exactly what that means. There is no current approved FDA test for the antibody just yet. There are those that are out there, but we're not quite certain for those that have been uh, infected by the virus who've developed antibodies if in fact those are protective and how long they last or how durable those are. I think um, what's important is that uh, as a transplant community, um, when you look at when surgeons were surveyed exactly sort of what they were thinking, that there, there was an appreciation that um, we didn't know everything about this virus. And so, you know, the majority of, of transplant surgeons were, uh, when asked about this, they were either highly concerned or extremely concerned. I'd, I would certainly be nervous if no one, if someone said not concerned. Um, but there was, because of this, uh, a, a quick sort of turn to say, we probably should hold transplants. And the numbers, and I'm going to show you some pretty impressive pictures that demonstrated the change in volumes of donors and transplants. In fact, almost 72% of living donor kidney transplant programs stopped altogether. Um, a large proportion of deceased donor transplant programs had some major restrictions. If you look on this right slide, um, you can see that um, some were more organs more than others, some that were considered sort of uh, more um, life-threatening than others. And, and while we still continue to say that transplant is not an elective operation, things like living donor transplants were thought to be too high a risk. And so in my field in kidney transplant, when we looked at some of the sort of the ways in which we balanced risk versus benefit, the folks that we were transplanting were you know, those that um, we thought couldn't wait. So particularly those that were in a dialysis unit, um, people that were running out of access, those that had lots of antibodies. And we tried to use kidneys that we thought would allow people only short times in the hospital. And the reason why we looked at um, particularly folks in dialysis units was there was undoubtedly a high uh, rate or high prevalence of, uh, of uh, COVID you know, within those units. And we knew that one person in a unit developing COVID could mean a large number of people subsequently um, by transmission developing as well. So so these were some of the, the data points, again, the story, thinking about how we could continue to do transplants safely um, while assuring that you know, we weren't actually causing more problems trying to fix them. But when you see that the, when the volumes uh, declined, as I mentioned, um, there were certain subgroups that um, were perhaps disadvantaged more than others, the, the elderly, 60s and 70s, there was a significant decrease in the amounts of transplants, um, private insurance, um, for some reason, females greater than males, but we did again have to um, sort of sort out, you know, what was the the best pass moving forward in terms of who we should transplant and who, again, the the risk was greater than the benefits. This is again the really remarkable data if you look at it to, in these snapshots. The numbers of deceased donor transplants week over week, um, the week the week of March 29th to April 4th was when we saw the the small the sh the greatest decline in the number of deceased donor procurements, only 164. And this was very regional. And so if you, you look at, again, I, I took a snapshot of the picture up in the Northeast, you can see that 
the numbers of donors were in the single digits for some weeks, and that was you know not surprising. It was difficult to get into an ICU. Um, there there was um, you know a concern at that time about making sure we had appropriate testing of donors. When you then look at um, transplant volumes again, that that time around the early April, um, our the nadir was uh, 405 transplants in that uh, week of the 5th to the 12th. When that's divided between living donors and deceased donor transplants, there was one week in the entire United States where only 16 living donors were done. Not surprising. Again, talking about safety of living donors, that was the right thing to do. And you can see that concomitant drop in living donor transplants as well. Again, very regional. If you look at, again, in the Northeast, I'm just going to uh, uh, focus your attention at, uh, at that bottom left, uh, living donor transplants. There were several weeks in the Northeast where zero living donor or transplants were done. Again, not surprising, but it's important to still recognize the significant impact that this virus had on the volumes of transplants. But there, there is absolutely something to celebrate, and I'm going to leave many times talking about celebration. The numbers of transplants um, that uh, were done um, 20 this time 2020 versus the same time uh, 2019 um, increased numbers of transplants. So despite the fact that we are fighting this virus, more transplants overall have been done. Um, when you look at, uh, again, this, um, sorry, that was the, the numbers of donors. When you look at the numbers of transplants, again, more uh, transplants have been done. Um, this really comes from deceased donor transplants. On the left side, you can see that living donor transplants are still behind what they were in 2019. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised by that. But if you look at um, the numbers um, from 2020 versus 2019 at the same time, you can see that um, we, in fact, are, uh, I think, doing very, very well. Um, we were actually very pleased that we were able to continue to do this, the numbers of transplants at Georgetown. So while there were some programs that were unable to transplant along the way, we were able to, um, you know, continue to uh, do our transplants. Um, uh, so this is, you know, information which uh, we were very proud of to continue to be able to do our transplants, and that was a, a, a team effort. Uh, many uh, organs came from the Northeast because, as I mentioned, they were unable to do the transplants at that time. And um, coordination with OPOs allowed those transplants to happen in our area. Um, so treatments. So a lot of um, you know interesting treatments you know certainly came forward. Um, you've heard probably about all these. I don't want to spend a lot of time, but I think it's very exciting to see um, that we have you know found a way to treat this virus. How we've you know found a way to um, there's now um, a monoclonal antibodies which have been approved for emergency use for folks that have mild to moderate symptoms. Uh, that we hope to be able to, to keep people from entering the hospital, convalescent plasma from folks that have um, been, um, uh, haven't been affected by the virus in the past that have allowed those to recover. Um, and of course, immunosuppressants you know, have been used on a regular basis. There really is no secret. Um, I think that's an important message to go away with, that the things that we tell everybody that we should be doing um, are the things that even transplant recipients and, and living donors should continue to do. So there really is no secret. I, I love this slide about you know the the risk, low, mediums, and high risk. It, it's not hard to appreciate that wearing masks from carriers and you know those that uh, wish to to stay away from the virus is probably the best thing that we can do to prevent spreading the virus from one to the other. We've gotten very good at using telehealth. There's probably many on the line who have you know figured out that um, a lot of things that we used to do in person we can now do um, through a computer screen. It's been a little bit challenging for those of us that like to be connected with our patients. We do lose some of that, but this is probably one of the greatest positives um, to this pandemic was that we moved the timeline up faster in terms of utilizing telehealth. We've developed uh, abilities to assure that hospitals are safe. And so folks that are, are waiting for transplants, please know that hospitals have created units where it's very safe to receive your transplant. And I think that is you know, something that um, hospitals and health systems um, have very much committed to. We don't know specifically, although Dr. Molnar is going to talk about outcomes and transplant recipients, um, but we there hasn't been specific data that shows there's a higher risk of being infected uh, as a transplant recipient, but we do know that there is some risk for folks that are taking transplant immunosuppressive medications. Patients should know if they are exposed that they should contact their transplant program um, a lot of stuff can be done as an outpatient. Um, we make sure that people continue to take all of their transplant meds. If there's any con changes or concerns, we certainly ask folks to contact their transplant program as soon as possible. From a UNOS perspective, please know that every deceased donor is tested and it's very low risk for a, a deceased donor transmission of COVID. Um, 
We do advise that um, living donors who are interested in moving forward, if you've ever been exposed or traveling to an area, to please um, quarantine for a period of time to prevent um, the risk of, of developing COVID and transmitting that for a living donation. Um, and we're still trying to figure out the right time for people that have been exposed to the virus before uh, proceeding with transplantation. I think everybody has kind of developed these, um, these cards or these uh, ideas to kind of help um, people um, through their daily days. Um, and again, very simple things that everybody, regardless of being a transplant recipient or not, should be able to follow very easily in order to remain healthy. In terms of vaccines, I, I won't spend a lot of time. I'm not a vaccine developer. I'm not a virologist. But it is, to me, one of the, the most impressive things that I've seen in a long time. You've, you've, of course, heard about Operation Warp Speed. How can you not love a name, Warp Speed? Um, but recognize the, <laughs> the combination of federal investment and public investment, over $12 billion have been invested in the development of these vaccines. <clears throat> we've all been, um, we've all know a little bit of vaccines. We probably know more now than we ever thought we knew. Um, inactivated viruses from, through which I hope everybody has already received their influenza vaccine this year. Um, again, a very common way in which um, vaccine development has proceeded. Um, there are protein-based um, vaccines, um, particularly those uh, in healthcare, um, uh, who have, um, I'm sorry, particularly those uh, who uh, have experienced a, a, an outbreak of shingles, hopefully, you know, have uh, received the shingles vaccine. Um, it's a very different way in which a, a vaccine is developed, in which um, the immune system is exposed um, to the proteins themselves rather than actually the virus, and we utilize um, recombinant viral proteins. Um, utilizing a viral vector, particularly adenovirus, has been very common in uh, eradicating some of the things like smallpox and Ebola, but what we're currently talking about is a real new technology and direct administration of RNA uh, and DNA to cells. It, it required us to have the sequence of the virus, which was actually done very early in January of this year. Um, a complex sort of process, but you know, again, thank God there's smart people out there that, are, that have figured out a way to be able to develop this virus. Um, these MRA vaccines, um, they deliver um, uh, the, the genes are delivered into our cells to increase our immune response to that spike protein that I talked about before. Um, many of you have heard the great news, and it's amazing how this was planned at this time, because who would have thought we would have had data just last week of the success, the initial success of at least two of these vaccine trials. Um, we expect, hopefully, emergency uh, use release in the near future. Uh, again, I don't want people to fear the vaccine. All this information is still going to go through a data safety monitoring board. It's still going to be approved by the FDA. It's still going to go through the CDC for how vaccinations are going to be passed out. And so I tell people, when the FDA says it's the right time for you to receive that virus, please get to the front of the line, because this is um, something with which we want to make sure people are approaching with data-driven decision-making and not with fear. Um, again, the, the outcomes, the initial data that's been, that's been supplied by these MRA vaccines, you know, well over 90% success. Uh, Moderna came out and they were 94.5% success. And the next day, Pfizer came back and said, oh, yeah, we're 95% effective. The data is incredibly exciting. And so I'll leave by saying we don't, we don't exactly know when this is going to end, but the future is bright. Um, anybody that's interested in it who's been a living donor before, Please take precautions. Um, follow the governing bodies. Um, if you're a recipient, we, we should take extra precautions, um, but don't assume that just general guidelines apply to you. I, I say whatever your guidelines are, wherever you live, remember, you choose to take whatever you think is best for you. I, I also ask you to don't fear the vaccination. The development didn't take shortcuts. The volunteer and public safety remain priority, and so I think it's something which people should be confident in moving forward. And finally, uh, I'll leave you with this graphic. This was something that was shared with me early. I, I don't even remember when, and, but I'll just simply say that, again, I, I, I hope everybody is um, remains safe you know, during this pandemic. And I think if we've learned two important things, one is nothing matters more than your health. Please always protect your health. And two, be kind to each other. During this time, we really need each other more than anything else. Um, a simple smile and, and being certain to, uh, to be appreciate the challenges of, of everyone around us. Um, we're going to get through this. And it's going to be something which we are going to be very proud of as a community that we found a way to beat this pandemic. And, and with that, I will <laughs> thank you for the opportunity and, and pass on to our next speaker. Doc, thank you very much. That was uh, a great presentation and, and very informative. I have to ask, does it get confusing being in Georgetown and uh, D.C. area being called the president-elect? 
of uh, of you know, of course. I don't, yeah, I I don't want that that real president job. I, I'm I'm happy to stay away from that. <laughs> That's a tough job. Well, congratulations to you, and uh, I'm sure that uh, we've got some great questions for you after we hear from Thanks, Don Eric and Don Eric and uh, Dr. Molnar. So, on that note, I'll pass the uh, microphone over to my friend Don Eric, who was our uh, Bounce Back Give Back Award recipient uh, by CKF a few years ago and, and joined us in Aspen for our Summit for Life event. Uh, not only is uh, he an awesome dude and a uh, transplant recipient, he's also uh, an organ donor. So as I said earlier, has a very unique perspective. So uh, Don Eric, welcome to the program and thanks a lot for joining us. Hope you're doing well and staying healthy. I wish we were uh, seeing each other all in person. Uh, I've said on a, our previous webinars, I miss my friends these days. But uh, glad yeah. at least I get to see you uh, in this format. Yeah, uh, I I really was excited uh, when Lauren asked me, and and just a uh, happy birthday. What a what a great way to celebrate your birthday, and and uh, I'm you catching know, up to you. I, buddy. I really, yeah. Well, you need a few more to catch up to me, but <laughs> keep working at it. <laughs> but I, I, you know, I'm so grateful to be a part of the the Chris Clue Foundation, and and being a the bounce back award giver was, or recipient was probably one of the highlights of my life you know, a pre and post transplant. So I really appreciate the work that you do in helping to move the mission and vision of organ donation, you know, forward. Um, it's something that, that stays on the front of my, uh, my to-do list every day. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. You bet. We love, uh, love having you and would love to hear uh, your story for a few minutes uh, from your perspective. I think you're an incredible speaker and do a great job telling it. So uh, I'll let you uh, share it. You're a lot better at it than me. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Well, uh, I think as as you mentioned, my my uh, experience with organ donation started pretty early on, way before I thought I needed uh, needed an organ. Uh, my dad uh, had diabetes, and we were uh, business partners, and and he had been on uh, peritoneal dialysis for quite a few years, and and as a lot of people know, dialysis is rough on the body, so. Uh, one day we were having uh, dinner and he just happened to say to me, hey, um, I went, got a checkup and it looks as though I'm going to need a kidney transplant. Would you be interested in donating? And I honestly didn't even stop eating. I was like, yeah, whatever you need, just let me know. Sure, I'll donate. And never really heard anything else about it for the next couple of years. And once again, having dinner with the family, he said, hey, we just got back from the hospital. It looks like you know, things are, are taking a turn for the worse. So if you're still wanting to donate, we need to get it going. So so that was back in probably 2005. I started prepping and fortunately I was a match and started going through all that process. And, and we had a very successful, uh, you know, kidney transplant uh, in, in 2006. And uh, the, the transplant went off successfully. I was back to my normal self in, in probably six weeks or so back to working out, back to riding bikes, back to playing softball, and, and never really thought anything of it. Um, and uh, the kidneys served him well for, for the rest of his life. Um, but it wasn't until 2009 where I started having heart issues. Uh, just really literally had one bad day and realized that I was really short of breath and you know, uh, kind of not really freaking out, but worried a little bit. So my wife and I went to the, the hospital, the emergency room, and they said, you know, your mitral valve is failing. And my lungs were actually like 60% full of fluid at that point. And so I had to, I was in the hospital for a week and they basically said, if you had went to sleep, you probably would have suffocated. So uh, I'm glad I didn't fall asleep and I'm glad that I was able to get that done. And you know, went through the open heart surgery process and, and once again, back to my normal life, you know, working out, started racing BMX again and and knowing full well that things were different. I wasn't able to do as much as I could do before, but you just make adjustments because as, as you know, you, you just adjust. And so I went on living my life and um, it wasn't until 2014 that things got really bad. Um, I had a defib I had a, a, a defibrillator uh, installed and I was, I kept having these, um, I kept my, my heart kept jumping out of rhythm. So I kept having VTACs and, um, they ended up, uh, 
checking my machine and they said, you know, if your machine had gone off um, 40 times in a, in, a, in a six month period, we'd be concerned. Yours went off 400 times in a six month period. So they were really concerned and they wanted to do an ablation, um, which when they, when they took me into the cath lab to do the ablation, uh, they put me into VTAC to identify the damaged parts of my heart. And I ended up going into VTAC storm and I coded right there on the table, which, you know, in all honesty is the best place in the world to code. If you're going to code, it's in the cath lab, which a bunch of, with a bunch of professionals that knew exactly what to do. But uh, they shocked me 70 times to get me back over like a 45 minute period. And fortunately I survived, came out of the hospital 11 days later. And we went straight to Cleveland Clinic, where they told me on day one, you're going to need a heart. And I didn't believe them, um, but they put me on the transplant list as a, as a 1B status. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to go on with my life. So I went to grad school. Why? Well, I signed up to go to grad school. I started working. You know, I was always working again, running a business. And my health just got worse and worse and worse to the point where I couldn't walk up a flight of stairs without taking a break. And um, in January of 2015, I went to Cleveland Clinic for a checkup. And after doing the, the biopsy, they said, you know, you're really bad. We're going to keep you until we get a heart. And of course, you know, there was a lull in, in transplants during that time that I was there. And I was there for 49 days in ICU. Uh, I had had a couple of infections. Um, I only had one kidney, so they were really trying to protect that kidney. And things just weren't looking too good. Um, I'm a pretty pretty positive guy, so I was trying to stay upbeat. My friends and family were all there visiting me every day. But um, as things got worse, we started talking about a total artificial heart uh, just to kind of keep me around a little bit longer until a heart became available. And uh, it was it was kind of a weird thing to go through because at the end of every night, you're, you're praying for, you know, to stay alive, but you know, in order for me to be alive, somebody has to die. And that was really tough for me to do, but they have such good people at, at Cleveland Clinic and my social worker, you know, put it in perspective. And she said, you know, if, if you are fortunate enough to get a heart, it's because somebody wanted you to have it. And the best thing that you can do is live an incredible life. And, you know, I really took heed to what she said and it made my prayer a lot easier um, and a lot more simple. Um, but I, w I was, I was lucky. I was really lucky. Um, we got to the point where they were, they were thinking, you know what, we're going to go ahead and do the total artificial heart just to keep you around. And I'll never forget being in my hospital bed and my wife was coming up, uh, to Cleveland to, uh, meet with the doctors the next day because they were going to do the, uh, the total artificial heart surgery on Monday. Friday was my birthday and they didn't want to do it on my birthday. They said, enjoy the weekend and we will do the surgery on Monday. So I'm on the phone with my wife, my nurses uh, come in the room, about six or seven of them came in the room, which was normal. They would always come in and kind of say goodbye or, or say hi when they got on shift. So I didn't really think anything of it. And they said, Hey, we want to sing happy birthday to you. So I'm like, okay. So I put my wife on speaker. I said, they're going to sing happy birthday. So they're all gathered around my bed and then my doc, one of the docs comes in and she says, we've got a, we've got a surprise for you. And anybody that's ever been in ICU knows that the food's terrible, especially when you're on a cardiac diet. So I literally thought they had like snuck me in some macaroni and cheese because that's what I used to beg for all the time. And, and so when I asked her what the surprise was, she said, we found your heart. And I was completely blown away after the hugging and the crying. They were like, all right, we got to get ready. So, um, you know, we started prepping at eight o'clock that night. And at 1 a.m., uh, I was wheeled into the OR. And, you know, probably eight or so hours later, I came out with a, a, a new heart. And um, it, was, it was that simple. It was February 26th, the day before my 45th birthday. And it was the best present that I could have ever gotten, you know. So, and it's, it's a really amazing thing when you think that I was affected in a positive way by somebody who had no idea who I was. 
he just made a decision that, you know, hey, if the worst thing in the world happens to me, I want to help someone. And that's literally what organ donation is all about. You know, just deciding to check that box, which is something that I promote as often as I can, because without that selfless gift, and it was a gift, um, I'm not here having this conversation with you. So I live for a few different reasons. One, I honor my donor, Eric, um, who, who gave me the gift. Um, I live the best life I can because I'm lucky to be here and I don't want to leave anything on the field. I will not die on the couch, you know, and so I really enjoy every day of my life. And then I also live for those that weren't as fortunate to be able to, to enjoy, um, you know, the gift of life through organ donation. So, you know, that's, that's my story and, and I'll tell it as often as I can because I think at some point, everyone's going to be affected by organ donation, either directly or indirectly. So, you know, it's my job to make sure that people know my story and, and know about the Klug Foundation and what you guys do and, and how we get that, that 21 people a day who are dying, waiting for organ donation, how we get that number down to zero. So that's my mission. And, and I thank you guys for allowing me the opportunity to tell my story. As you said, you've indeed lived uh, and are living an incredible life. And uh, I think you embody the Chris Klug Foundation mantra of live life, give life. I love yeah, uh, I love hearing your story and we love you, Don Eric. Thanks for being a part of this. And thanks for all you do to give back to the transplant community. You're truly a champion of the transplant community. I, I love that about you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Keep up the great work, brother. Absolutely. You're not off the hook yet. I got some good questions for you. But I want, right. to, uh, I want to pass the microphone now to uh, Dr. Miklos Molnar, uh, who's going to round out our presentations. Dr. Molnar recently published the Outcomes for Transplant Recipients and COVID-19 Research Study, uh, and he's going to share that with us now. Thank you very much, Dr. Molnar. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chris. And if you guys didn't put me in a very easy position after these two <laughs> stories uh, from Chris, it's my presentation is pretty boring. and. Um, I thank you so much for having me, for the organizer, and thanks for all the patients and, and relatives to, um, uh, to be here and, and listen to this presentation. So basically, I was asked uh, uh, to talk about this um, a paper we just recently published, one of the Transplant um, uh, Journal, and I tried to summarize the, uh, our results, which um, I think it's, um, it's one of important paper in, in, this, um, in this period of time. So I've... This is my disclosure. I served in few advisory board, but it's not related to this topic. So, as Dr. Cooper already mentioned, um, there was data about that uh, being transplant patient is a, uh, maybe a considered a high risk for complication for COVID-19 because of uh, their immunosuppressed status. But as Dr. Cooper already also mentioned, uh, this is like a, a two. Uh, uh, this is a. This is not straightforward because the immunosuppressive medications what um, our patients are taking is actually weakening the immune system. So go back to, uh, to the pathophysiology of this disease is basically um, the, the inflammation, the response to the COVID-19 infection cause uh, sometimes more problem than the virus itself. So taking immunosuppressive medication it might help and that was a theoretical um, uh, uh, consideration that might be, it's not as bad as we think in, in transplant patient, but all of the data uh, uh, before our paper and a few other papers basically just described the, uh, the COVID-19 death rate, complication rate in, in a transplant patient, but never used any uh, control group. So we didn't know whether it was because of being transplanted or because of this patient has more uh, comorbidities. So mainly it was just case reports and single center studies without any control group. These studies showed very consistently that um, if the uh, transplant patient is being hospitalized, the mortality rate is around 20% um, um, in our country and in Europe as well. Uh, but again, there was no, we didn't know this 20% is because there is more diabetic patient, more patient is obesity, hypertension, or just because kidney transplant or transplantation itself is contributing to this higher risk. So our aim was uh, to address this knowledge gap and we compared uh, solid organ transplant versus non-transplant uh, patient with COVID-19 infection was admitted in the intensive care unit. So all of our patients was critically ill 
who was admitted to the ICUs throughout um, uh, the US using a multi-center study. And based on this uh, uh, theoretical consideration before over the immunosuppressive medication, we thought there will be no difference uh, between mortality and other complication between transplant and non-transplant patients. Um, I was part of this top COVID trial, which was um, uh, which this trial was part of this big trial. So I just want to introduce this top COVID trial, which was um, uh, led um, uh, by uh, Harvard. It was a multicenter observational study. That means that we didn't do any in intervention. We just basically collected data how uh, the ICU patient is taken care of, and also the complication and outcomes. Uh, in the entire uh, US, uh, eight, uh, 68 um, hospitals across the country. And the, and the goal was that study was focusing on uh, mortality, acute organ injury, and identify treatment strategies uh, to improve survival uh, in these patients. Uh, if somebody wanted to look it up, this was the uh, clinical trial number of this study. So as I pointed out before, that most of the, um, uh, the problem came from comparing different groups, so comparing apple to, uh, uh, to uh, peaches. So basically, uh, we wanted to create a cohort which is comparable. And let me give you um, an example of how we did that. So this is just, this is just a figure to explain this. So let's assume that uh, the people who is represented in black in these slides is the people with co more comorbidities, hypertension, uh, diabetes, more obese, so generally a sicker patient. So if you assume this group is the transplant group and this is the general population group, you can see there are more uh, patients in black, which represents more sicker patient. So comparing this group in general with the general population group where that is more like healthier patient, it's not fair comparison because um, not the transplantation itself, but maybe the comorbidities which is contributing to the higher mortality. So what our aim was um, uh, with the statistical method that we uh, used is basically selecting comparable groups, so comparing apple to apples. So selecting from this big group of transplant patients or of those patients uh, which we can compare to the general population. Obviously, the goal was not to lose too many patients, so it's still uh, being generalizable of the results. And this is how we did. So the 4,500 uh, um, uh, patients was included in this cohort. Again, critically ill patients uh, admitted to the ICU with, in, uh, with confirmed COVID-19 infection. We had 105 patients who, uh, uh, who was solid organ transplantation, and a little bit more than 4,000 um, from the general population non-solid organ transplantation. So we were able to select from this 105 patient 89. So we just lost only seven patients. Um, and basically, we, with this 98 patient, we uh, were able to compare them with 288 patients with very similar comorbidities, other than being transplanted. Our outcome of interest was primary uh, outcome was the mortality within 28 days in the, after the ICU admission. And we assessed some of the um, so-called secondary outcomes, like complication, like ICU length of stay, uh, how many patients uh, required mechanical ventilation, how many patients required so-called extracorporeal uh, membrane oxygenation when the lung is uh, completely failing and we are putting the patient in the machine to help with the oxygenation of the body. We were interested in obviously with acute kidney injury, especially the patient who required diasis, also lung complications, secondary infection, um, uh, clot events, and, and being on uh, so-called pressors uh, supporting the circulation of these patients. This is a very busy slide and I, I don't want to go over on that. This is just describing the, uh, the entire cohort. Again, this matched cohort of almost 100 uh, transplant and almost 300 non-transplantation. I just want you to focus on the, uh, the age. So the, the general age was like 60 um, and majority of the patient was male. Uh, the, the biggest race was African-American. 40% of the uh, patient was African-American, 33% was white. As expected, the, uh, the major comorbidities was diabetes, hypertension, pulmonary disease, and, um, and uh, heart failure. And um, uh, also, a uh, majority of the, uh, the patient was a, a non-smoker. And this is the first um, uh, slide. If you can recall, uh, Dr. Cooper's slide uh, just showing them the symptoms of, um, of COVID-19. We found the same in the, in the total cohort. So the most common symptoms was obviously fever, 
cough, uh, shortness of breath, and, and fatigue. But when we compare the uh, symptoms by the patient who were transplanted versus not transplanted, we find some interesting differences, which was confirmed by other studies and we are seeing in everyday practice. Namely, transplant patient is reported more uh, diarrhea, GI symptoms. So even though you don't have like cough or shortness of breath, but fever with, with diarrhea, that can be a sign of um, uh, a COVID-19 infection and slightly more um, uh, nasal congestion, which is not a very common uh, symptom so with, um, with COVID-19. This is just really like pointing out some uh, lab differences in, in these two uh, population, transplant versus non-transplant. I just wanted to point out one, uh, the patient who is taking immunosuppressive medication, the transplant patient has less common fever and the fever is uh, less uh, severe than a non-transplant patient. So, it's not necessary to, to have a fever in, in the transplant population. And this is the main results, um, uh, just basically showing the, the main outcome. So as very similar to other previous uh, trials, the, the mortality rate uh, within 28 days in the IC was around 40%. There was no difference between the uh, transplant and non-transplant patient. There was no difference in the ICU stay. The patient who required mechanical ventilation always is close to 80%. The only difference what we found is basically there was a higher trend um, uh, uh, requiring diasis in, in, um, in the transplant population. 37% of the, uh, of the transplant patient required diasis during the ICU admission versus 27 in the, uh, in the non-transplant patient. So there, the main message is there was no difference between outcomes, not even secondary outcomes, so organ um, uh, complications and dysfunction, except um, uh, acute kidney injury and, and um, requiring diagnosis were more common in transplant population. And this is just uh, uh, another visualization of the results. Let me guide you through this slide. So basically, this is the uh, so showing the risk. Um, uh, this is the so-called interval of the risk. And whenever the risk is, is crossing the one line, that means it's not really difference between the two groups. This side of the uh, of the graph is representing high risk for transplantation, and this side is representing the lower risk of uh, solid organ transplantation. As you see, all of the outcomes crossing this one line, so it's not reporting any difference, except that uh, the patient who required diagnosis. Again, there was like 34% higher risk, uh, potential for higher risk in the patient with solid organ transplant. And this is just not all the transplantation, just the kidney transplant population basically showing the same results. There is some background noise, I'm not sure everybody hears that. Um, but yeah, so that was just in the kidney transplant recipients. So our conclusion was that uh, the 28-day 28, 28 mortality in transplant patients was very similar to non-solid organ transplant patients. There was no difference between uh, uh, these two groups between um, uh, ICU length of stay or any other organ dysfunction except uh, um, higher risk for uh, uh, renal replacement rapidiasis. Thank you so much. That was all I wanted to show. I'm ready to answer any question. Wonderful. Well, I'm sure we're going to have some, uh, some questions for you. Thank you very much, Dr. Molnar, for that uh, presentation. So it sounds like we're not at a, a as transplant recipients, not necessarily at a heightened risk of more problems than the general population, if you will. Yeah, so don't forget, these are all ICU patients who admitted right. to the ICU, and um, it's not telling anything about what, what is the probability to getting uh, to catching the infection or being on the hospital. This is all like ICU complication, but yes, this study basically showed that. Great, well, thank you very much for sharing it. Don Eric, I want to uh, pass the microphone over to you, and uh, I want to ask you if you found a balance between taking proper precautions and participating in uh, social activities and uh, resuming your normal routine. I do see the drum set behind you, and I want to explain that a little bit more too, but are you striking the right balance between staying safe and continuing your uh, normal activities, which I know you love? Well, it, it's it's funny you say that because, you know, when this thing first hit, my, my wife was telling me, now we all are being begged to do the things that I've been telling you to do all along, which is as, as a transplant patient, we have to be really careful anyway. So 
you know, for me, you know, washing my hands, I, you know, whenever I race my bike, I'm, I'm traveling all over the, the place and, and I've always kept masks in my, in my gear bag uh, for that very reason, because a lot of times you're in close places, especially in the, in the winter time when I'm racing indoors. So there's dust and there's germs. It's like a Petri dish in there a lot of times. So I've always kind of kept a, a mask with me just in case. Um, so it was really a matter of just being a little more hyper vigilant about cleanliness, you know, about staying clean. And then I even went as far as buying a, a one person tent, which is like a six by six tent just for me. So it's just me, my bike, my gear bag, my helmet <laughs> at every race. And people felt so sad for me because I was by myself, but most people knew my and they understood why I was why I was kind of staying away from everybody. Um, it can be hard, uh, especially those first few months, you know, where you're you're used to to being in group spaces. But you know, no social event is worth my life, and there's no guarantee how as a as a organ transplant patient I would be affected by COVID. And that's a question that I get that I hear and read about a lot in in our organ transplant. Facebook, you know, groups and everything. And, and, uh, it's just not something that I want to take a chance with it. You know, it was, it was refreshing hearing some of the, the data that's being collected. But at the end of the day, I, you know, as a, as a regular Joe still don't know enough about it because it hits people in so many different ways. We've seen, you know, I had a staff member who was 75 who got it and she got tired. She stayed home for a couple of weeks and she was fine. But then I've also known of you know, people in in my city, you know, a doctor who ran 19 marathons. He was a cardiac surgeon and he went through a terrible ordeal and, and passed away. You know, so we just, I still just don't know enough about it. And, and I have really appreciated, you know, listening to the doctors because I was probably one of those skeptics who was like, I'm not so sure I want to put, you know, you know, you know, these, these, uh, these drugs in my body because I don't know how it's gonna how it's gonna interact with with uh with my you know my uh organ transplant anti rejection drugs and things like that so so this has been really insightful for me but you know for me it's just a little more of the same trying to stay socially distant um, not hanging out with people uh, trying to keep that core family unit close together. You know, and I think as we get further and further out from this, people start to get more and more relaxed, but I just can't afford to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, and I've been around people who are like, oh, you're wearing your mask. Why are you doing that? And I'm, you know, I just tell them, you know, hey, this is a decision I've made. If you don't want to wear yours, that's fine. No. But as for me and mine, I'm going to wear them and, and continue to do what I need to do. You know. I think that's a good strategy. I've said uh, many a times that, I think I'd do fine if I got it, but I don't want to find out. So right. I, uh, exactly. like you, I'm being real careful. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Cooper, what uh, social activities uh, or aspects of our normal routine can transplant recipients safely participate in? Uh, it's a good question, Chris. It's terrific to just follow Don Eric's answer to that question because he really um, – I think outlined a pretty good plan. In fact, I wrote down two things that he said that were, I think, really important. He said, no social event is worth my life and it's not something I want to risk my life over. So, I, and I, I think my my answer to this question, if you had asked me maybe six months, is different than what it is today, only in so much as I know and I'm confident that this uh, vaccine is coming forward. I, we got to be smart in sort of how we're making those decisions. And in truth, you know, a lot of social events and opportunities that may have been risky in some ways have already been sort of stopped for us, you know, so things like movie theaters and concerts and boy, all the stuff that I used to love the summer for, we weren't able to do this summer. Um, but, you know, it's again, I think using your smarts, never being forced to do something you don't want to do, but, you know, washing your hands, sanitizing surfaces, staying a healthy distance away. I think one of the, the big things that people want to know more about is, you know, going out to restaurants. You know, I, I'm, I'm a little I'm a little anxious, you know, when there is no sort of restrictions in the numbers of people that are allowed into a restaurant. But, you know, most places, particularly in our area, they're at 25 to 50 percent capacity. And I think, you know, if you're able to maintain that still that social distance, 
from the table next to you and again wearing your mask um, washing your hands I, I think all that all that stuff is fine um, most of those outdoor activities that a lot of us like to do certainly that you love to do you know those things are all I think perfectly safe recognize again you know as transplant recipients or immunosuppressed recipients there still is that general risk um, but again I, I want people to to hold on just a little bit longer for that vaccine to come out because then you know, we'll be more confident and comfortable to go do those things without the fear of, of what you know, may happen thereafter. And we can continue to, to do all those things then 5, 10, 15, 20 years after that. I think that's good advice. I've done a lot of uh, fun mountaineering adventures this summer uh, by myself or, or one other person and some great bike rides. And uh, I know it's cliche to say the silver linings, but we've had some wonderful uh, family camping trips out in the middle of the desert outside of Moab and uh, and around Utah and, and Western Colorado, just with my wife and kids and I. And uh, there's still been some real uh, silver linings in all of this. But uh, as I said earlier, not a not a lot of socializing these days outside of our household. It's good family time, though. Good family. Exactly. Exactly. Dr. Molnar, are there um, some other studies that are underway similar to yours that might uh, also show the risk to transplant recipients relative to the general population? Yeah, so there was one study just recently published, um, very similar um, than ours um, from Henry Ford, when they included around 50 um, transplant patients as a general population, and they were focusing on hospitalization. So whoever was hospitalized uh, was the survival inside the hospital, not just the ICU. And they basically found very similar results in ours, that um, after taking into account all the other uh, factors, comorbidities, the transplantation itself it didn't increase the risk. So uh, this is where we are now. There are some data from Europe um, uh, compared like waitlisted kidney, uh, trans uh, kidney patient versus transplanted patient which showed them uh, a little bit higher mortality in transplant uh, uh, population, but that again didn't adjust it, didn't take into account comorbidities. But the most recent one um, actually showed completely the opposite from the uh, from our country, that actually transplant patients did better uh, than, uh, than waitlisted patients. So I still don't know the answer for that. I think it really depends on the, uh, the population, but so far the data is reassuring that transplant itself is not a big risk factor, especially patient who is years out after a transplant. I heard some uh, some early conversations that in fact the tacrolimus or serolimus or the anti-rejection drugs that many of us take morning and night today uh, in fact may uh, somehow uh, reduce the risk of ARDS or the cytokine storm or something and many of us in the transplant community were uh, really happy to hear that that hey maybe we're on the uh, one of the immunosuppressions that may actually help us avoid some of the worst side effects of this, but I guess that's not uh, that's not guaranteed by any means yet. Yeah, yeah. so that, that, absolutely, that's actually one of our explanations why we are not seeing the same what we are usually seeing for other infections. So maybe these uh, medications can help with the so-called, as you mentioned, cytokine and storm. And that was actually a medication which we are using for like chronic rejection, the called tocilizumab which we are using um, uh, some patient, again, with not clear results about tocilizumab, but that's, uh, that goes with the same kind of uh, thinking about the pathophysiology of the disease. Well, let's hope that's the case. Yeah. Don Eric, what, uh, what tactics have you uh, implemented to cope with some of the mental challenges of COVID? And uh, I know this has been emotional for all of us. You know, it feels so precarious for me you know, sending my kids to school right now. They're elementary, six and nine years old. And so the risk is probably significantly less for me at 48 years old with a liver transplant. But I'm scratching my head, you know, every day wondering if I'm doing the right things and am I overreacting or am I not being careful enough? And uh, how are you dealing with the, the emotional and, and mental challenges that this whole pandemic uh, presents us with and especially maybe even more so in the transplant community as recipients? Well, you know, it, it wasn't so much for me as it was for my parents who were elderly, who I, I do a lot for. And, and my dad um, was had been sick. He had a stroke 
uh, back in June of 19. So he was really sick and I was going to see him a lot. So I really didn't so much stress about me as much as I did not being able to see my parents. And, and unfortunately my dad did pass away. And one of the biggest things, you know, that I worried about was right around when COVID was really hitting its peak, they closed down the nursing home. I just didn't want him to die by himself, yeah. you know, and I, I really worried about that. I worried about my mom, but um, our, our local hospice facility did an amazing job of making sure that she was able to be with him in his last hours and, and we were able to, to be with him as well. But that's really my biggest worry is, is just making sure that those individuals who are elderly, who, who may not have access to all the things that they want, how can we stay connected to them um, and making sure that, that people who are around elderly people um, are, are taking all the necessary precautions. Um, but as, as far as me uh, personally, uh, you know, Chris, we've always had to adjust. People who have gone through, through you know, things like we've gone through are used to taking punches. And you, you tend to just roll with it and you do what you have to do. You buckle down and you, you play the cards that are dealt you. And I think if we all do our part, we can get through this thing a lot quicker. But, you know, it helps to have technology. It helps to be able to have Zoom calls and, and uh, you know, we're able to stay connected with friends through I have a couple of Zoom calls a week with a group of buddies and, and you know, we've had couples Zoom calls and, and, you know, at any given time, you'll see four or five of us standing in a, in a driveway, you know, six feet apart talking. So you just make the necessary adjustments that you have to make. It's nothing that we haven't been doing, you know, most of our, our, our time as, as transplant patients. So really, it's just a matter of trying to stay positive um and and looking at the glass is, is half full more so than than half empty i think that's it's important you know for everybody to do that not just people in the transplant community but you know just knowing that, that people are out there working hard and and doing what i can do you know within my power to help this to help us through this is, is most important so we just try to do you know in, in my house the, the best that we can do um to, to, to get through this thing. So. Attitude is everything, Don Eric. You, uh, you know all yeah. about that. Yeah, exactly. Good for you. Thank you. Dr. Thank you. Cooper, you, you touched on this just a minute ago, so I don't want to uh, um, ask you the same question, but what are some things as transplant recipients we can do wanting to be active and, and still uh, participate in, in some of the activities that we're all so passionate about and love, whether it's snowboarding or kiteboarding or whatnot for me, or or just trying to go out and, and maybe eat eat out safely. What are some of the things we can do as recipients to mitigate some of those risks and, and try to resume uh, some activity safely? Yeah, it, it's interesting, Chris. The things that we said at the beginning of this pandemic as being kind of what what folks thought were kind of uh, basic stuff, you know, like wearing the masks and washing your hands and socially distancing, is still the same message that we're now giving, you know, nine and ten months into this. And so, you know, the answer to the question is, is you know, we people should be able to enjoy life outside of the bubble, and the bubble right now is your home. Um, but simply doing those few things and continuing to do them religiously, even if folks around you aren't. Now, I would say if folks around you aren't, it would be best to try and stay away from them. And hopefully most people are sort of respecting your space and, and your desire to remain healthy. But you can only control what you can control. And again, continue to do those simple things, I think, can allow people to enjoy you know, some degree of social life outside uh, of the home. I'd say the the one thing that I'd be careful with is is in the decision to to travel, you know, travel particularly long distances, travel on airplanes. Um, while I still think it's safe, that's an extra added risk, and so I, I would just say be be certain that the travel is worth that risk. Um, you know, we as as healthcare employees, we're we're actually asked not to do any travel whatsoever, so we can, can we can avoid that risk. And to me, that's that's fine because again, what is most important to me is is my family and to be able to do my job. So I don't want to lose those sorts of things. So, but if you do, you know, sanitizing surfaces, wearing the masks and all those things are, are really wonderful. And, and then, like I said, 
or like Don Eric said, you know, there's a lot of things you can do now through social media. I was going to ask him if he's done the Zoom happy hours yet. Boy, those are pretty impressive. <laughs> you can get a bunch of people together and you can make a happy hour anyway out of anything about it now. But, you know, th th this isn't um, this doesn't require people to isolate themselves. You just have to do all those simple, smart things, like we said, way in the beginning of this pandemic. And, and that'll keep you safe. Great. That's what we want to do. It's sort of the tale of two pandemics in that, as you said in the beginning, the future is very bright with the uh, Pfizer and uh, and the other vaccine uh, preliminary results, but we just have to get there. And I guess that that's a question, Dr. Cooper, for you and for Dr. Molnar is, when do we think that the vaccine will be available? I've heard some uh, some military members and, and some healthcare members uh, have been informed that it could be as early as December next month. Um, and when do you think it will be for the general population? And then the second part of that question is, as, re as transplant community members, recipients, uh, those that are immunosuppressed, we're somewhat of a niche within that general population. And therefore, does that mean transplant recipients are more at risk? They might get it earlier or perhaps much later because uh, because we are a niche and it's going to take a little more testing to to answer that question. Yeah, it's a, it's important questions, Chris. And I think um, I was on a, a teleconference recently with uh, one of the heads of virology for the NIH, who actually, <clears throat> again, you know, was very positive about not only the initial results of the vaccine, but the truth is, is that because, and, and it was named, you know, uh, appropriately to try and move this process further than, than or quicker than most vaccine development was, I wouldn't be surprised. In fact, I, I'm, I'd be quite shocked if we don't see that uh, vaccine available uh, before the end of the year. Um, now, again, I, I want everybody, recipients or not, to recognize that the process with which the approval is happening and will happen is not different. It's just the timeline in which it's happened. So the risk is not to patients and to those that participate in the trials. The risk was really a financial risk on the part of the companies who, unknowing whether this was going to be successful, still went forward and recognizing that there was a commitment from the government. But the initial uh, individuals to whom the uh, vaccine will most likely be targeted, um, frontline healthcare workers, first responders, uh, elderly, um, and as they more and more um, as production is more successful to produce more vaccines, um, the general rollout will probably be decided by the CDC and it will take several months for that to happen. In terms of transplant recipients, you're right, there hasn't been uh, data that specifically looks at transplant recipients. The closest to that is, is HIV positive patients, which is not the same whatsoever. But what, I, what again I'll say is the FDA has a responsibility to safety. And if the initial approval is to say that it is safe to give in this subset of population, which may not include transplant recipients, when it gets the data for transplant recipients to say that it is safe for transplant recipients, you have to feel comfortable in knowing that the priority was your safety and your efficacy. So like I said, the run to the front of the line when, when it says it's your time to get that vaccine. The, the riskiest thing should be the car drive over to your primary care doctor, whoever it is, as you get that virus. I'm sorry, that vaccine. You, you yeah. don't want to miss on this because it is very, very purposeful and it's going to save your life. Dr. Molnar, when the um, vaccine is available, will there be some uh, studies pretty quickly uh, specific to those that are immunosuppressed? Yeah, I think Dr. Cooper already uh, mentioned that, uh, that these trials which was done is not included. And transplantation but there is a plan and um, I think Dr. Cooper is better know that than me about um, uh, trials in transplantation. What I know uh, from the uh, from the literature and our own patient is basically with the with the native virus there was a good response at least two-thirds of the transplantation responded very well so we expect at least this or even better response for the vaccine regarding uh, protection. It's still questionable how long the protection is going to last but I don't think anybody knows that at this point. I think for many, uh, many of us as transplant recipients, uh, it's taken some time to dial in our anti-rejection drug cocktails. And uh, I think introducing the vaccine, there's maybe a little apprehension. And uh, I think you answered that pretty well, Dr. Cooper, of, of running to the front of the line. 
But what would you say to somebody that is just says, God, is, is it safe? And how's this going to interact with my anti-rejection drugs? And, you know, I, I want to wait for a little more data. Mm -hmm. Again, you have to make the decision that you believe is right for you as an individual. I, I'll always say that and always believe that. <clears throat> but again, um, I'll say that, you know, both uh, the FDA and I'm certain your transplant physicians who you've partnered with for this long in your transplant journey, again, are looking at your safety as their top priority. Um, yes. And as we get the data in transplant recipients, um, the the offering and the suggestion to receive that vaccine is, again, based upon data-driven decisions. So this isn't just, it sounds like the right thing to do. Um, there will be data to support it to be the right decision. But you know, transplant recipients tr or not, you know, if the decision is I want to wait until later, th that's fine too. That's not necessarily a, a wrong decision. I, I would just say that um, th hopefully make that decision based upon your review of the data and not because of a, of a fear of the unknown, because, it's, because the data should suggest that it is a safe thing to move forward. Dr. Molnar, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, yeah, just one supportive data for the for the vaccine so we know from from the past that um, the only risk for really transplant patients of that vaccine includes like living parts and this is this is not going to include any of those so based on our historical experience um, i think it's, it's going to be safe but again as dr cooper said we we will make this recommendation based on data wonderful well, I want to give you guys a chance to uh, to wrap up this conversation with anything that I may have missed. Um, we uh, we sure enjoyed both of your presentations and Don Eric your uh, contributions and sharing your story. But uh, Dr. Cooper, maybe I'll start with you. Is there anything else you'd like to share as we uh, wrap up our conversation today? Yeah, I just uh, and I think your story and Don Eric's story just demonstrated again that. You know, transplant and organ donation and transplant is, you know, a, a, an absolute success story before the pandemic, and it's an absolute success story during this pandemic. We have learned, you know, some tremendous things about, you know, how important it is to continue to assure that we are never wasting the gift of life and that we are continuing to look at transplant as life-saving and, and not an elective surgery. And what I, I think is, uh, you know, wonderful is to see that throughout this pandemic, the, the transplant network has found a way to assure that organs continue to get where they need to get to so that people receive that gift of life. And I, and I, I want to thank the Chris Klug Foundation and the coalition for putting this together, for educating patients and you know, for continuing to, to remind me you know, why I get so excited about this job. It's just the, the best job in the world. So thank you for this opportunity. I really do. You bet. Thanks for all you're doing. I appreciate it. And thanks for spending time with us today. Dr. Molnar, you want to add uh, anything? I, I also want to thank the, the opportunity to talk today and just really ask everyone that just love your neighbor and wear the mask. This is really the, the minor things to do and can help a lot of people, especially in, in sicker patients. So thank you so much for having me. We are all in this together and got to, uh, got to look out for one another to get through this. Don Eric, would you like to uh, add any closing comments? Uh, yeah, just uh, just thank you, Chris, uh, for allowing me to be a part of this. The the Chris Klug Foundation does amazing work. Um, you know, there isn't a day that goes by that I don't appreciate my gift. Uh, I'm excited about Dr. Cooper and his new position at Uno. If I had a chance to visit there a few years ago, and and I stood there where all the computers are, and I'm like, man, my name came across one of those computers one day, and it's an amazing. It's just an amazing thing to be a part of that this even happened. So, you know, just thank you uh, to both doctors for all the amazing work that they do. And, you know, we just have to keep keep on keeping on and continuing to be safe. And let's continue to spread the word about the importance of organ donation. And, and me and my wife are trying to get back out to visit you guys during the summer so we can do some mountain biking. <laughs> You're always welcome, brother. We'd love to have you back. And uh, I look forward to uh, getting together again with uh, with you and your wife when we're on the other side of this. As I said in the beginning, Absolutely. we miss our friends, but it'll make it that much more special when we're all together again. Exactly. Don Eric, thanks a lot for joining us. I want to say thanks to uh, Dr. Molnar and Dr. Cooper for uh, spending some time this afternoon with us. And 
sharing some insights on uh, on what's ahead in terms of the vaccine and and how we're uh, addressing that and and what to prepare for as transplant community members. Uh, I want to say thanks to uh, everyone that joined us today. I hope it was a helpful conversation. Uh, this snowboarder did the best he could to uh, help facilitate the conversation. I hope it was helpful. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, feel free to reach out to us at chrisklugfoundation.org uh, anytime if we can be of help uh, in any way and uh, try to help answer your questions. We've got uh, some great people that are uh, helping us all get through this together and, and happy to help in any way that we can. I want to remind everybody too that our uh, Summit for Life event, uh, summitforlife.org, our 15th annual Aspen Summit for Life uh, event benefiting Chris Kluge Foundation is taking place uh, starting on Thanksgiving Day through Sunday the 6th uh, of December. And uh, again, you can register for that. It's a little different this year. It's a virtual event. We've had to uh, pivot as an organization as well uh, to virtual conversations, and in this case, a virtual uh, uphill. Uh, so you can climb 3267 vertical feet from the comfort of your home, uh, which is the vertical of Aspen Mountain, uh, or about 1600 feet, the vertical of Buttermilk Mountain, from the stairmaster in your home or the staircase at uh, your local uh, workplace or, or stadium or whatnot. So lots of ways to do it and, and stay totally safe. So uh, check out summitforlife.org. I hope you'll join us. Want to uh, pass the microphone back to our executive director, Lauren Pierce. Lauren, awesome job organizing this conversation today and uh, all of our ambassador panel tours this year. I hope uh, everyone's enjoyed it. I know uh, I speak for uh, our volunteer board and everyone at CKF. You've done an awesome job and thanks a lot for making this happen. Thanks. Thanks for that, Chris. And thanks for everyone that joined us today. I know that there were a ton, there were a ton of questions submitted. Uh, we are going to be going through all of those questions and uh, we'll include them, the answers in them in the survey that you'll receive after this webinar ends. So uh, we're not we're not ignoring the questions. We just ran out of time. Um, we want to equip you all during this time of COVID and wherever you might be in your transplant journey, but uh, we can only do that if you let us know how we can help. The recording of today's webinar will be available at chrisklugfoundation.org and our new COVID-19 transplant resource website. We hope you have a great day, stay safe, stay healthy, and remember to wash your hands.